Welcome, thank you for coming back as always. It's Tuesday the 5th of May. Now I've got a couple of important papers to bring to you today. It's a bit sciencey this one. Now I know the sciencey videos aren't for everyone so I'm going to give you the bottom line so you don't have to sit through it all but there are some really important takeaway messages. Now I've had hundreds of emails and comments, literally hundreds, asking about strokes in younger people and I haven't really commented much on it up to now because the literature has been limited, but that's starting to come through now. So I want to report on a paper from the New England Journal of Medicine. Now, this shows that in two weeks in New York City, there were five strokes in younger people. And that's at least four, about four and a quarter more than they would expect. And all of these patients did have, have COVID-19. So it does appear from early data that there is an increased number of strokes in younger people with COVID-19 infections, but not many. So five in two weeks from the whole city of New York. But it does seem to be a, a complication of this condition. Now, this doesn't change the fact that COVID-19 is more serious in older people. It's more serious in people with comorbidities. Yet... A small minority of patients, and these were all under the age of 50, there is an increased probability of stroke. So that does seem to happen, but it's not common. So don't worry about it too much. It's not common, but there's a very important public health education message here. And you may be aware of FAST already. If someone has a stroke, you have to act FAST. FAST stands for face, A, arms, F A S speech and T for time. So it's face, arms, speech and time. And in arms we can include legs as well. So the face can become unequal. Now the weird thing, I won't go into detail now, but that side of the brain controls that side of the body. So if there's a damage on stroke on that side of the brain, this side of the face won't work properly like that. So what I normally do is a quick check is get someone to smile and pull a face or something and see and, and if you're watching them just see if it's symmetrical see if the facial expressions are symmetrical if there's a droop on one side or a weakness on one side then take immediate medical advice act fast if there's a weakness in the arms or a, a lack of sensation in one of the arms normally on one not the other uh, then again act fast or, or again weakness or loss of sensation in one leg or if there's difficulty with speech Difficulty in speech can be in two forms. It can be that people can't quite get the words out, that the muscles don't seem to work properly. You know when you've been to the dentist and your mouth doesn't quite work properly if you've had an injection? There's that, or there's the fact, the, the other type of speech disruption is when people can't think of the word. So the, the mouth works, but they can't quite think of it. The brain doesn't pop the word into their consciousness. So remember, F-A-S-T, face, arm, speech, time, if you suspect a stroke. Now, a couple of the patients in this study delayed medical advice because they knew there was a COVID-19 pandemic. Do not do that. Take medical advice immediately. Because if people get to hospital really, really quickly, in hospitals they can give drugs to break down the blood clots that cause the stroke. So that, that, that's the first one. Now, the second one, the second paper we're going to look at is vitamin D. And this is quite an amazing study, really. It's done in Indonesia. And it shows that people with low vitamin D are 10 times more likely to have uh, complications and die. Now, it's not a peer-reviewed paper, but we're going to look at it. But 10 times is a massive finding. So it does appear that people with low vitamin D, according to this paper, are more likely to have complications and more likely to die. Now, we, we know this from other studies related to other types of infections, but this one is specific to COVID-19. So what we suspected is true with COVID-19 because we know that from people with other types of chest infections. We know other types of chest infections are more in common, are more common in people with low vitamin D levels. Well, this one is specific and it also seems that it's the case with COVID-19. So another reason to increase vitamin D levels if they are deficient. So go to your doctor, ask him to do a vitamin D test and start getting vitamin D in. As I've said before, I'm taking 50 micrograms of vitamin D a day. Right, that's the bottom line. Now, if you want to skip it now, I won't be offended. That's what I wanted to get across. But the detail is very interesting. And I'm going to explain a bit about the science and the, the disease processes as, as we go along as well. Now, obviously, you'll be given the, uh, the reference so you can check this for yourself in case I'm making it up. 
Now this is large vessel strokes. Now <clears throat> the large vessels, so for example the large vessels like the, the vessels in your neck, the carotid artery. So if you feel that knobbly bit in the middle of your neck, let me show you how to do this. It's good to be able to do this anyway. If you feel that knobbly bit in the middle of your neck, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, the bit that vibrates when you hum like that, put your fingers in a line like that and then just push them around the side of that back into the middle of your neck. And that's your carotid artery. That's a big artery. And that goes up and it gives rise to what's called the middle cerebral artery, which goes to either side of the, the, the brain. So the, the, right, the right carotid is going up to the middle cerebral, the right middle cerebral, the left carotid going up to the left middle cerebral. And these are the big arteries. So you can get a stroke, a, a blood clot in those big arteries. That's possible. The other sort is in the small vessels within the brain itself, but these are the big ones outside the brain. And what's ha what happens is, if you imagine that that's, um, let, let's show you this on a, uh, that one. <clears throat> so let, let, let's imagine that this is with the blood supply to, to the, uh, the brain, that, that's going through an artery. And as we know, the arteries divide down into smaller vessels like that. Now, what happens is, um, and, and, and this would be going to part of the brain. So let, let's imagine that's part of the brain up there. So that's part of the brain. Now what happens is, in these large vessels, there's a blood clot. A blood clot can form here. So we can see that blood clot has formed. And can you see that's going to reduce the blood supply? The area that's left for the blood to get through. So the blood has to try and sort of squeeze around the clot like that. Or sometimes the blood clot can completely block off the vessel like that. So if it completely blocks off the vessel, that's called a thrombus. There's a blood clot. And if bits of that blood clot break off, it's called an embolism. So these are sometimes called thromboembolic strokes. And that means that area of the brain, so the blood's supposed to go up there to that area of the brain, but it's cut off. That is basically what a stroke is. So it's cutting off the blood supply to part of the brain. And the weird thing, the weird thing about the brain and the nervous system is that it's the left-hand side of the brain that controls the right-hand side of the body. And it's the right-hand side of the brain that controls the left-hand side of the body. Strange, but it's, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. So these are large vessel strokes. They're talking about large vessel strokes here. So it's the large blood vessels that supply the brain. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and it's presenting in patients with uh, COVID-19 in the young. Now, these patients were all under the age of 50. So the ages of the five patients. So there was a two week period in New York. It was from the 27th of March to the 7th of April, two week period. And the patients were aged 33, 37, 39, 44, and 49 that had these strokes and it was the large vessel strokes and this actually is a very common type of stroke we treat this routinely in A&E departments typically in older people though but not always not always so five cases reported in New York City in this two-week period New York City is a big place so we can see it's not common but enough to get a cohort of five patients one woman the woman was aged 33 and the men were 37, 39, 44, and 49. And these are large vessel ischemic strokes. Now, what, what ischemia means is if the blood supply, let's suppose we're dealing with this area of the brain now. So if, if the blood supply to that area of the brain is not cut off, but reduced like that. So if there's a blood clot that's reducing the blood supply. So now instead of the blood going through an area of vessel that wide, as it should, it's only going through a little bit like that now. So there's a reduced blood supply. And that reduced blood supply is called ischemia. Ischemia. I guess in the States you leave the A off. So ischemia is the reduced blood supply. But either that can still damage that part of the brain. So ischemia is the reduced blood supply. So we're talking about ischemic strokes here. Lack of blood supply to the brain type strokes. Large vessel ischemic strokes, five of them. And SARS coronavirus 2, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus type 2 that causes COVID-19 was diagnosed in all five of these patients. 
So this is significant. Not common, but highly significant. Now, patient one, <clears throat> um, it's the only one we look at in detail. 33-year-old woman, previously healthy young woman. Developed cough, headache and chills lasting one week, as you would expect with COVID-19. And then she developed progressive dysarthria. Now, the problem with these medical patients, is the, these medical journals, is they use complicated terms. <laughs> so dysphasia, dysphasia is difficulty speaking when you can't think of the word. But dysarthria is difficulty in speaking because your mouth doesn't physically work. So one side of her mouth wasn't working like that, so she couldn't quite form the words. She knew what she wanted to say, but she couldn't quite form the words. That's what that means. So she was progressively dysarthric. In other words, she had a face feature. Her mouth wasn't working properly. And presumably a tongue and all the other bits that form speech. And also she had um, numbness and weakness in the left arm and left leg over 28 hours. So if it was in the left arm that was weak, left arm was weak, then the stroke was affecting the right hand side of her brain. And it was. They did a scan and they found it was affecting the right middle cerebral artery. And that's the big artery that goes up, up there, to, up to all this side of the brain here. It's the large artery supplying the side of the brain. And this side of the brain is important because that's where the movement centres are. So all the movement centres here are going to supply movement to the left-hand side of my body. So it's a very important area. And uh, she also had a COVID lung involvement on the x-ray. So there's no question that she had COVID disease. Now, she was treated with uh, various drugs. So antiplatelet therapy is to make the blood less sticky. And then she was given full anticoagulation therapy to thin the blood. So she was giving blood thinning treatments. If she got there earlier, they could have potentially given drugs called thrombolytic drugs that could have actually dissolved the blood clots, got rid of the blood clots altogether. But she arrived too late for that unfortunately unfortunately that's why you have to have to act fast if there's a stroke because you don't have much time now she had um, repeat angiography in hospital so this is computerized tomography that type of x-ray angiography is looking at the blood vessels angio is blood vessels graphy is to look at or to make an image and uh, the blood clots actually resolved within 10 days so these blood clots that were causing the problem the, the, the body had absorbed them after 10 days and they're gone. But the problem is the blood clot will go. The blood clot will be absorbed. It will be broken down. But the damage that's done to the part of the brain which was cut off often does not recover. Because the brain cells that are responsible for movement don't effectively divide. So the brain damage can be permanent even although the vascular damage is, is, uh, is repaired. This is the problem. Permanent brain damage is what we're worried about in strokes, sometimes called cerebrovascular accidents. And it looks like she did have some permanent damage because she was discharged to rehabilitation. She didn't go straight home. She went to a rehabilitation facility where she'd get physiotherapy. Now, by comparison, in a typical two-week period, over the past 12 months, our service has treated on average 0.73 patients under the age of 50 with large vessel stroke. So instead of 0.73 patients in a two week period, there was five and they were all positive for COVID, indicating that this is almost certainly a complication of the COVID. Now, this is actually consistent with previous studies. Now, there was a retrospective study that's referenced in this paper from Wuhan where they went back and looked at the data afterwards and there was increased incidence of stroke among hospitalized patients with COVID-19 uh, and they found it was much more common in China approximately five percent of hospitalized patients now remember the hospitalized patients are the ones that are more poorly anyway five percent is a big number but in the Chinese study the youngest patient to have a stroke was 55 and of course, older people have disease of their vessels much more commonly than younger people do. So they weren't recording younger patients in Wuhan, but in New York they were. 
although they were recording strokes in Wuhan, but it was in older people. And also, there was an outbreak of SARS in 2004 in Singapore, <clears throat> and large vessel stroke was also reported then. So this is known in, uh, in other coronavirus infections. So this is the, the, the SARS coronavirus 2 causing strokes in, or being implemented in strokes in Wuhan. This is the coronavirus 1 way back in 2004, also implemented in causing strokes in Singapore in 2004. So it looks like we're dealing with a real phenomena, but um, relatively small numbers, thankfully. Now, why is this happening? Now, um, I'll just mention this briefly. Coagulopathy means that there's a disease conditions where the blood is more likely to clot. Coaglu, that's coagulation of the blood and pathy is disease of. And it's affecting the vascular endothelium. So the, um, the, the blood vessels, the blood vessels are lined with vascular endothelium. So they're saying that there could be an increased likelihood of the blood to clot, or there could be a problem of this vascular endothelium, which makes the blood more likely to clot. So they are the possible mechanisms that they're talking about. So coagulopathy or vascular endothelial dysfunction makes perfect sense. We knew that already from other from other pathology. If you've watched other videos earlier in this series, that's called Verkau's triad. And the third one that makes clot more likely is, is a di di dysregulation of the, the, the linear blood flow, turbulence in the blood. But they're not saying that was this case. They're saying disorders of the vascular endothelium and the blood more likely to clot. Now, Obviously, they're saying that the association between large vessel stroke and COVID-19 in patients requires further investigation, but it does seem to be a real phenomena. And this was very sad. Two patients in our series delayed calling an ambulance because they were concerned about going to hospital during the pandemic. So if they got there earlier, the brain damage might not have been as extensive. So remember, if you suspect strokes act fast, but remember, this is rare, but does seem to be a genuine phenomena. So I think the bottom line there is, as we mentioned at the start, we can say that strokes do seem to be a complication of COVID-19 disease in younger people. But it's a very rare complication, thankfully. But it is one that's worth knowing about so we can act fast if we are worried about it. Now, the next paper I want to bring you today is, is this long running saga of the, the vitamin D story that the entire world, apart from you and me, seem to be largely ignoring. But the, the evidence is becoming really quite significant for it. So um, this study is from Indonesia. Now, before we do that, let's just revise on Liz's excellent uh, graphics to show the importance of this. Now, the role of vitamin D in protecting the lungs. So when viral particles enter the lungs, they can cause inflammation in the alveoli. But most is caused by, so, the, so, so in other words, the inflammation in the alveoli here that collects this fluid is caused partly by the virus, but partly by the inflammatory response so the idea is that the viral infection is less likely to occur in patients who have plenty of vitamin D and the inflammatory response is less likely to occur in patients that have plenty of vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D is involved in all of these immune cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, neutrophils and dendritic cells, all of which are immunological cells that they facilitate the immune reaction. And we also know that a lot of people are short of vitamin D. Now, roughly 10% of vitamin D comes from the diet and 90% comes from sunlight. So 90% of our vitamin D comes from sunlight. And studies have found that many people in northern latitudes are deficient in vitamin D. <clears throat> this vitamin D deficiency is, is even more pronounced in people with darker skin. So the darker your skin, the more slowly you will produce vitamin D. The lighter your skin, 
the more quickly you will produce vitamin D for a given amount of sunlight. So this is particularly a risk in younger, in darker skinned people, sorry. But as, as we've seen, it, 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 they are lower in many people as well. Just dark skinned people are particularly prone to it. Now, this study doesn't take long to go through. Now, it's not a peer-reviewed study, but it is published. And when I read it, it did make a lot of sense. It seemed to be a well-conducted study. And it's a retrospective cohort. So that means they looked at a group, a cohort, after they looked back retrospectively, uh, which included two cohorts, active and expired. Now, it's written in funny language. Expired means they died. So people that were alive. In other words, people that were alive and people that were uh, people that had died. Of 780 cases with laboratory confirmed COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection in Indonesia. So 780 people is a good sample size. That, that, that's good. Some had lived, some had died. Check the link for yourself. Now, they concluded that age, sex, comorbidity, vitamin D status and disease outcomes were no, right so this is what they recorded they recorded the people's age their sex their other diseases their vitamin d status and what happened to them whether they died or not basically how ill they got so that was recorded and they recorded this is a this is the normal way of recording vitamin d levels 25 25 ohd levels now they're using the uh the uh kind of old-fashioned way of recording i'm actually i'm not sure if this is how you record it in the states but anyway, they're saying normal was greater than 30 nanograms of vitamin D per mil. Insufficient was 21 to 29 nanograms of vitamin D per mil. And deficient was less than 20 nanograms of vitamin D per mil. So, so that's what they were saying. So these are blood levels. So they were taking the blood levels greater than 30 nanograms per mil they were taking as normal. We could argue that's a bit low, but that's what they did in this results, in, in this study. Now, the results was, uh, they, looked, they, they worked out what the death risk factors were. So who was more likely to die? Well, men, we know that. Males were more likely to die. Older people were more likely to die. We know that. Pre-existing conditions, people with comorbidities were more likely to die. So this is confirming what we already know, but it's always good to have it confirmed. So men are more likely to die than women. The older are more likely to die than the young. Those with comorbidities are, the, are more likely to die than the previously healthy. But they also found that people with below normal vitamin D levels were more likely to die. So they found that group three were more likely to die than group one. That's what they found. So they <clears throat> did some statistics to control for age, sex and comorbidity. So they allowed for that. And they still found vitamin D status is strongly associated with COVID-19 mortality uh, outcome of cases. In other words, you're more likely to die if you've got low vitamin D levels. That's what they found. And when they compared group three that were deficient with group one that weren't deficient this is what they found when compared to cases with normal vitamin d status death was approximately 10.12 times more likely for vitamin d deficient cases that's what you call the odds ratio so having accounted for the other risk factors people that were short of vitamin d were 10 times more likely to die and this p-value is the probability that the result arose by chance. So it's a good result. So if p equals 0 0.05, that's a 5% chance that the result arose by chance. If p equals 0 0.01, that's a 1% chance it arose by chance. But it's not. It's p equals 0 0.001 so that means there's only one chance in a thousand that that result arose by chance so this is very likely to be accurate there's only one chance in a thousand that that, that result is is a is a freak is what they're saying 
So really, that is pretty powerful evidence. Now, we've looked at evidence before that other infections are more likely in vitamin D deficiency, as well as a whole host of other diseases. Um, and we looked at evidence that influenza is more likely in people that are vitamin deficient. So we inferred from that that um, people with COVID-19 were probably going to be more likely uh, to have uh, complications and die. But we didn't know that for sure because we were inferring from data from research carried out on influenza. But this is on COVID specifically. And when this paper's peer reviewed, I really hope it gets splashed all over the world because this is just a huge factor. I mean, this is actually saying that people that are low in vitamin D are 10 times more likely to die. It's just huge. Now, if this is confirmed, what this would mean is that by reversing vitamin D deficiency all around the world, in other words, taking people from group three, sorry, in other words, taking people from group three who are deficient and putting them into group one that are normal would reduce global death rates by 10 times. 10 people would die for every 100 that would have died normally. That, that's, that's what it means to me. And that is nothing short of amazing. So let's hope more people get onto this because at the moment they're simply not. In government guidelines, I, I see no reference to vitamin D in COVID-19 infection. It's a very, very strange blind spot that governments seem to have. So next time you're talking to your healthcare provider, say to them, look, is it true that people that have very low vitamin D levels are 10 times more likely to die than people that don't? If so, what does that mean? What should I do about that? And see what they say. But let's really hope doctors and governments around the world start picking this up big time. OK, that's that. Let's look at some... Um, it's Tuesday today, so let's look, let's look at some Tuesday people. Got a few Tuesday people here. Viewers from around the world. Ah, oh, now, no, no, I know we've seen these before, but they, they sent me this. Um, I can't remember your names, ladies. I'm sorry, but they're <coughs> from Poland, and they've sent me this in to show the cat was real. Because I, I said, "Is that cat real?" Well, it is. There's the proof. So thank you. We have a real cat, <coughs> which is good. Okay, this is Alan from Cornwall in the south of England. Lovely part of the world, Alan. I do like Cornwall. Rocky coastlines, beautiful area. Thank you for watching. This is Angela, and I don't know where Angela's from, but it looks like she's taking, is it vitamin D? I'm not sure. Okay, so thank you for watching, Angela. You're looking very healthy now, do stay healthy. This family is uh, Annie, Micah and Richard, who we can hardly see, let's blow them up a bit. There we go. Always good to see families watching together. And they're in the same household, so they don't really need to wear masks. But I think they're probably just doing it as a good example. So, well done. Thank you for that. Always nice to see families watching together. That's nice to see. This is Antonio and uh, Antoinette in the Philippines. Okay, so um, that's the same dose of vitamin C I'm taking. 50 micrograms is 2,000 international units. So if you're taking one of those a day, that's the same dose I am taking. Although I suspect you can get plenty of sun in the Philippines when you go outside, unlike the north of England. I mean, really, doctors should be measuring this and working out what it is. Now, that's someone's dog in the garden. In fact, I, oh, yeah, that's right. It's, uh, it's Carla. So this is, this, is, uh, this is Carla's dog in Barcelona. Isn't it a lucky dog having a nice garden like that. Beautiful blossom, Carla. Beautiful city, Barcelona. I do like Barcelona. Thank you very much for watching in Barcelona. This is Felix and Alice. Well, it's their feet to be more precise. Glad to see they're relaxed while they watch. This is uh, Gopal in Chennai, Chennai, Chennai in India. 
the city that used to be called Madras in colonial days. So uh, Gopal from Chennai, glad to know you're watching in Chennai, Gopal. Sorry, it's Mr. Gopal, E. Gopal, right, okay, Mr. Gopal in Chennai. Chennai, sorry, <laughs> Chennai. Good to know you're watching anyway. This is Hassam watching in Pakistan. So welcome from Pakistan. Great to know your work watching in Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan, of course, is one of the countries that uh, we are justifiably worried about. A lot of people live in very close, uh, confined conditions. So thank you, Hassan, from, for watching in Pakistan. This is Kathy. And uh, I'm terrible with names anyway. They're watching in Austria. <laughs> and good to see that baby's watching as well. So whole family watching together. De Deary Mood? Sorry, Deary Mood. Um, I've pronounced your name wrong. I know I have. Good. So anyway, thank you for watching as a family in Austria. This is Lawrence in Quebec. Also taking vitamin D3. This is someone watching Lee in Honolulu, in Hawaii, watching in a garden in Hawaii. That must be nice. And this is May watching in Scotland. Another beautiful part of the world. Pity about the midges, but uh, <laughs> beautiful part of the world. Where I was born, in fact. Maureen in Australia. Marvellous, thank you for watching in Australia. This is a Phi, Phi Yu from Myanmar. Myanmar, just north of Thailand, just south of Bangladesh. Thank you for watching in Myanmar. And actually Phi Lu, whose name I'm pronouncing wrong, has done a brilliant job because she's translated my videos into Burmese into the Burmese language in Myanmar. So um, thank you for doing that. Very, uh, quite, quite a lot of work. I appreciate what you've done there. Uh, this is Riesh from Scotland. This is Tom, so I'm not sure where you're from, Tom. But good to know you're watching anyway. These are some masks that Zoe's made, I think. So well done, Zoe. And this must be Zoe sporting one of her masks. <laughs> I'm sure you've made them yourself, Zoe, haven't you? Well done. Okay, that's us for today. Thank you for watching.